This is an online lecture module recorded for Exercise Science 220 and we'll be covering the biomechanics of the kicking action. The kicking action is a diverse action that is seen across a number of different sports and can be different even within sports. So if we take gridiron as an example, the picture on the top right hand corner, there might be a different kick performed for the field goal and for the punt. Rather than trying to talk about all the different types of kicks across different sports, I want to break down one specific type of kick in um, one specific sport, which is the soccer instep kick. We can then talk about the similarities and differences that may have with other kicks. Um, one of the reasons for talking about the instep soccer kick in particular is it's perhaps the most commonly performed kicking action in sport, given the popularity of soccer worldwide. Before we talk in detail about the different mechanical factors of the instep soccer kick, I first want you to show you the whole motion. I want you to have a think about the motion, have a think about some of the mechanical factors that might be at play. So I'm going to talk about the important mechanical factors of the instep kick through the different phases of um, the action. The most important phase of the action is the contact phase of the action. So where the foot is making impact with the ball. And as you can see through this action here, that's really when the force um, is imparted on the ball by the foot. Um, and everything else we do in our body is either to make that impact or as a consequence of that impact or the actions that go around it. So this impact phase uh, dictates the uh, velocity of the ball, the trajectory of the ball and the spin of the ball. So all three components that are um, going to influence where the ball goes. If we take the velocity of the ball as one of the primary outcomes of the kick, um, it's known that what directly influences that during the impact phase is the um, impact of the, sorry, the velocity um, of the foot. So a higher foot velocity, a higher ball velocity. Now there are a couple of other factors that are play um, that research has indicated recently. One of those is that a higher um, ball velocity can be obtained from when the ball impacts on the foot closer to the foot's center of gravity. So this increase to the center of gravity increases the transition of velocity from the foot to the ball. Um, this is also seems to be related to some dynamic stiffness issues at the ankle. So um, the closer the ball is or the impact is to the center of the foot, the less the foot, once it impacts the ball, goes into um, greater plantar flexion um, and then uh, there's able to be more an efficient transfer of force from the foot onto the ball. So if we, so the key factors of um, how we influence the velocity of the ball in the instep soccer kick are the foot velocity at impact, also where the um, ball impacts on the foot, so closer to the center of gravity, the better in terms of transferring that velocity more efficiently, and also an increased dynamic stiffness, so less movement at the ankle. So aside from velocity of the ball, I mentioned that the um, impact phase is going to uh, dictate the trajectory as well as the spin of the ball as well. And those are primarily dictated by the path of the foot um, through this impact phase, as well as where the foot impacts on the ball. So if we take the sagittal plane, for example, if the ball, if the foot impacts lower on the ball, it tends to have a higher trajectory. And if the foot impacts higher on the ball, then the path tends to be a lower trajectory. Um, if the path is going from, of the foot is going from low to high, then we tend to have a higher trajectory and the path going from high to lower tends to have a lower trajectory. So two different influences um, on that. The same can be said if we think about this from a transverse um, plane. So whether the ball is going left or right, it's again due to the path as well as the ball. So for example, if we hit um, on the inside of the ball, it's more likely to go to move from inside to outside. The difference between path and the impact location causes an eccentric action on the ball. 
therefore creating the spin um, and obviously spin we know from the Magnus effect causes movement of the ball in the air as well. So those are the factors that influence trajectory and spin. So now we understand a little bit about how the impact of our foot on the ball influences the subsequent ball flight, so where the ball is going, the spin on the ball, the velocity of the ball. How does that actually occur? What leads up to that foot velocity and the foot um, direction and the impact? Well, the most or the, the phase directly before impact is the forward swing. And the forward swing occurs between sort of what we can see on the left-hand side and impact. You can see on the right-hand side we have a picture that's sort of midway down. Now, interestingly, you can see the position adopted at... Um, the start of forward swing, um, which happens to be the end of backswing as well, where we have our hip, which is hyperextended. We have a knee, which is flexed, and we have an ankle, which is plantar flexed. And through the motion, the hip tend or the tip will um, powerfully um, flex. So move forward. You'll have the knee extending through this time, and interestingly, there's an isometric contraction occurring to keep the ankle in plantar flexion. Now, in terms of um, the coordination and when these uh, movements occur that um, we know that skilled players typically will start the motion with their pelvis and trunk shortly followed by rotations at the hip and in particular that primary motion of um, flexion at the hip there um, starts we actually slow down the hip or good players tend to slow that hip motion down a little bit decelerate it um, which allows an effective transfer of angular momentum it's another concept we've talked about um, over the last couple of biomechanics units so transfer of angular momentum through the knee um, and transferring down into the foot. Now with the instep socket kick, we also have some, it's not just in the sagittal plane, the motion, we also have some motion in the frontal plane as well. So that hip is not just um, flexing, but it's also adducting and internally rotating as well. And all these actions are occurring concentrically. So if the forward swing is the action that really leads up to that impact, then backswing is the phase of the instep kick that we're really preparing to execute or have that force production through the forward swing. So we're adopting that position on the right-hand side, which is a transition between backswing and forward swing. And you can see this backswing phase starting um, in sort of where that picture on the left-hand side is. So during this period, the hips are hyperextending, bringing ourselves, bringing them back as far as possible. The knee is flexing and the ankle is plantar flexing. Also interestingly is the position of the left arm here. And the left arm, this left arm starts to abduct, gets pulled out um, during the approach, so the period before the backswing, and will stay up or move slightly around, um, but stay in a pretty similar position through backswing through forward swing um, and then finally start to drop during follow through. Now the reason for this left arm is to actually act as a counterbalance for the heavily rotating limb. So you can see the kicking limb, so kicking the lower limb there, the leg really going, uh, moving far away from the center of the mass of the body. And so therefore we're counterbalancing with the left arm so we can produce greater movement, really to allow this great um, movement occurring on the lower limb. Should also be noted that there's um, some trunk and pelvis rotation what's occurring in the socket instep kick, possibly um, more dramatic than um, other kicks um, performed in different sports. So we've looked at impact, we've looked at forward swing, we've looked at back swing. How do we get to that back swing position? Well, that's the approach. So the approach may vary in the game situation. It may be off a couple of steps, it may be off a run. Um, Isakawa and Lee's asserted in their paper that uh, approach angle of approximately 45 degrees is something that's a hallmark of skilled players, whereas more novice kickers of the um, ball in soccer tend to have a path um, that's pretty parallel to the direction of the target. So they'll come in nice and straight, whereas skilled players will come at 45 degrees, um, which is hypothesized to be to allow for more um, rotation, more axial rotation of the body, um, especially in this type of activity where you need to kick off the ground. So in working backwards from impact, the phase that we really haven't talked about so far is the follow through. Now the follow through is what occurs after impact uh, to the end of the action um, or into perhaps another action. 
And the follow through is a really interesting phase um, from a biomechanical perspective. Because from a performance perspective, if you uh, consider our influence on the ball after we've kicked it, we can't actually influence it at all. So there's nothing mechanically that we can do to influence the performance of the ball after impact has occurred. Um, however, what we do in follow through, what we do in focusing on follow through, perhaps um, can some can influence what we do before and during impact. So you often hear coaches talking about um, continuing to accelerate through the ball, um, having a big follow through, um, and coaching points like that, which actually influence the mechanics um, before and during impact, but doesn't influence performance directly during the follow through. Uh, it's also an interesting time from a mechanical perspective because whilst we can't influence performance of the ball, um, our body is actually undergoing some eccentric contractions or heavy eccentric contractions trying to slow the leg down, uh, which can uh, or exposes ourselves um, to injury. I'll talk about the specific example of that in a few slides time. So one way to conceptualise the important mechanical variables um, that we've discussed already might be in something like a deterministic model. So we can use deterministic models for all sorts of sporting tasks, and we've discussed that in previous lectures. Um, but here is an example of one for the instep soccer kick. So this was published by DeWitt and Hendricks in 2012, um, and they actually performed correlations amongst these variables. Uh, there's some assumptions there, so whether there is a linear relationship between these variables, whether that's consistent across participants, etc., that need to be taken into account. But this is a nice little neat way that someone might conceptualise what's important and how certain factors influence the end performance. So for example, ball velocity, um, if that's the um, important variable that we're looking at here, uh, we can look at the things that influence that. Um, so one example, one of the things that, that does influence that is the foot impact velocity. So that will dictate uh, peak ball velocity to some degree. Uh, and one of the influences of that might be the um, right knee relative impact velocity, so what's going on at the knee um, during impact, um, which then can be broken down um, into relative peak velocity and right knee relative peak velocity, or change in right knee relative peak velocity. So you can see it really the image, or you should be at here, you can read the paper for full details, but it's breaking down the skill so you understand how the knee might not directly, but indirectly influence um, the velocity of the ball. So now I've gone through the in-step soccer kick, which is one of the kicks, one of the examples of a kick in uh, soccer. Uh, we can come back to the different types of kicks that we started on in this lecture module. So we can see um, above the soccer kick on the bottom right hand side, so up the top right hand side we have the uh, a gridiron kick, or this in particular is a, is a kickoff, which is similar to kicking for a field goal, which is a little different from a punt. Uh, you can see, go, moving around in the anti-clockwise direction, you can see the AFL kick, um, and you can see a um, field kick in rugby there as well. Um, the mechanical factors we covered, there is, there is a number of similarities between these kicks. Um, for example, if you look at the non-kicking side arm, so in this case it's the left arm of all of these um, on all of these photos, you can see it's sticking out in a pretty similar way. So that idea of sticking your um, non-kicking side arm out to counterbalance the allow for greater range of movement and greater moment arm of the um, kicking side lower limb is pretty consistent across those kicking techniques. Difference in these um, often comes in how uh, upright the player is if they're kicking off a ball from the air or off the ground. So you can see with the AFL kick on the top left hand side, um, we're actually typically um, it's much straighter. So there's less adduction, abduction of the hips, there's less um, ankle inversion, eversion, less axial rotation around the pelvis and trunk. Um, so instead of that rotation, a little bit of rotational help that we get in that soccer kick, because we're kicking the ball um, at a higher point, we tend to kick through more primarily in the sagittal plane. The run-up tends to be um, straighter on as well. The final thing I want to touch on in this module is uh, the potential risk of injury during the kicking action. There are several different types of injuries that can occur uh, during or around the kicking action. Probably one of the most, or perhaps the most prevalent, is um, that of the hamstring injury. So the hamstring in kicking um, is important concentrically during the backswing phase um, to both hyperextend the hip as well as flex the knee. Uh, it's also critically important in the follow through period where it's eccentrically contracting to both um, slow the movement down at the hip as well as the knee. 
Um, and it's during this eccentric phase or eccentric loading during the um, follow through where the hamstring is at risk of most um, or at most risk of injury. So this is the end of the recorded module on kicking. Uh, there's much more research and uh, mechanical points on um, the mechanics of the instep soccer kick as well as um, a range of other kicks, um, which if you're interested in, you can investigate. But hopefully this gives you some sort of overview of the mechanical factors involved.